I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. Today I'm going to talk to Dr. Greg Moratsky. Greg has served in the ministry for 40 years. He's earned many, many degrees and is, not, and is now working on a PhD. He's one of the most connected disciples I know of. He's also a person whom I've seen transform and grow over the past 30 years. Just as Paul shared about his past, that he was a violent man, Greg had a rough past and character. However, he, like Paul, is transformed into a loving man who deeply loves people and the Word of God. In this episode, he shared us about his conversion, his path in the ministry, why he has so many degrees, and advice to those who want to study theology. All this and more on the Rob Skinner Podcast. <music> Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Just a few more weeks to the CLIMB Conference, Small Small Church Leadership Conference. I hope I'm going to see you there. It's going to be an amazing time, December 2021 in Dallas, Texas, December 2nd through 5th. If you're wavering, it's not too late. Just go to robskinner.com. It's going to be an amazing, inspiring time. Friday is devoted to helping you to do better spiritually than you've ever done. And Saturday is devoted to helping you come away with material to make 2022 your best ministry year ever. So please don't miss it. It's going to be powerful preaching and teaching. It's going to be a great time. Go to robskinner.com to register today. I'm excited today because I've got Dr. Greg Morutsky on the podcast. Greg is the senior minister for the Antelope Valley Church of Christ in Lancaster, California. He and his wife, Kathy, have been married for 40 years. He became a Christian at the University of Colorado, graduated with a BS in civil engineering, and also a BS in business administration. He worked as a civil engineer before entering full-time ministry. Then he continued his education at Pepperdine University, He received an MS in ministry and a Master of Divinity. He later gained a Doctor of Ministry from Abilene Christian University and an MS in clinical counseling from the University of Nebraska. Greg is currently pursuing a PhD in leadership from Johnson University. He's the Dean of the Los Angeles School of Ministry, plus he teaches at the Rocky Mountain School of Theology and Ministry. He also guest lectures at Rochester University. He's a National Board Certified Counselor and a Licensed Professional Clinical Counselor and a Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist in California. He's been in the ministry for 40 years, leading churches in Denver, Dallas, Omaha, Los Angeles, and San Diego. He also served in the campus ministry at UCLA, San Diego State, MIT, University of Colorado, Long Beach State University, University of Nebraska, and SMU. He and Kathy have two married daughters and four grandchildren. Greg, welcome to the program. Rob, thank you so much for having me. It's great <laughs> to be with you, brother. It is a great. I just reading through your your resume, I'm just blown away. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to get into this. Can you tell us how did you become a Christian? Yeah, I was raised in the Churches of Christ. My uh, mother is uh, third generation, and. Uh, One of my first memories as a child is uh, watching my father get baptized at a uh, gospel meeting by uh, one of our brothers in uh, the New New England area, Jimmy Allen. His father was a professor at Harding, and he did a uh, gospel meeting in Rangeley, Colorado, where my parents were uh, uh, going to church. And uh, so I was raised in the church, but then... uh, My father quit going when I was a teenager, and my older brothers, I have three older brothers, and they quit going, but I kept going with my mom, and uh, most of the kids got baptized about 12. I didn't because I uh, wasn't 
really that good a kid. I went because <laughs> uh, I didn't want my mom to go alone. And I loved my mama. And uh, uh, I was the youngest. So I think she she uh, held me pretty close. So maybe you could say I was a mama's boy, but I was also a daddy's boy. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I went to church. I got baptized at church camp at 14. Uh, studied the Bible with my count, camp counselor. And uh, he asked if I wanted to wait until my parents could come up and be there for the baptism. I said, no, I'm not doing that for them. I'm doing it for, for God. Mm. And uh, so I got baptized and uh, did all right as a Christian for a few years. I got best boy camper the next year. <laughs> but then uh, a couple years later, I got kicked out of uh, church camp for kissing a girl. Oh boy. And uh, I, I, in high school, I just uh, really drifted away, just drifted away. Okay. So you got baptized at 14 and you did well for a couple years, but then you drifted away. Tell me what, what happened there. Well, I got into high school and, uh, uh, you know, I just, uh, in Colorado at that time, the drinking age was 18. They had the water down three, two beer. And that was not a good thing, honestly, for the drinking age to be so low because I, uh, uh could grow a beard at, uh, 16. And so I looked a little older and I started buying beer and drinking and, uh, I, I, developed a bit of a drinking problem. And when I would get drunk, I would get angry. And, uh, I had, uh, three older brothers boss me around one older brother, just a couple of years older, had a very bad temper. My father had a bad temper. I see it sort of was a generational thing. His father owned a bar and had a bad temper. And I think my dad moved away from Oklahoma to Colorado to get us away. But, uh, he still had uh, internal demons and uh, with four ornery boys, you know, I look back and think, well, he, you know, he wasn't perfect. He tried, but uh, it would come out. And so uh, he, he get, would be physical with the oldest brother. And then this second, this third brother, and he was never physical with me, but uh, the brothers would be physical with me. It sort of all rolls downhill. <laughs> and uh, so I sort of grew up in fear, especially of uh, one of my brothers. Unfortunately, he he got ran over when he was a child, and uh, so, but he recovered. And my mother sort of uh, uh, overcompensated, and he, he uh, uh, had too much rain, and he became bit of a delinquent. Eventually I got uh, arrested, went to jail for several years. And uh, he always had problems, problems in school, problems with the law. He had problems with drugs and, and, uh, um, he's passed away now. And, uh, I, uh, I love him. I, uh, uh, that's a long story, but, uh, anyway, uh, I was afraid of him. He was sort of the toughest guy in town. And, uh, so I could never fight back or express my emotion uh, at home. And so unfortunately, all that built up. And when I started drinking, it would come out and I, I uh, would lose my temper, get into fights and did some very terrible things, hurt people. Uh, had, it really wasn't anger. It was rage. It was bad. And uh, it helped me to become a Christian, to come back to Christ and to become a true disciple. I, I went to use that anger in sports, it was all league and three sports, uh, that kind of thing. Got a football scholarship, went to Colorado School of Mines. And, uh, but uh, fortunately, there is when my lostness completely hit me mm. that I, uh, I can't keep living like this, sort of a good student and good athlete, but uh, with a real dark side, and a bad temper. And I just saw I'll never be able to stay married. I'll never be able to really keep a job for ever because I'll lose my temper. And, and uh, I, I saw I was becoming what I didn't want to become. I, I didn't want to become angry like my dad or my, my uh, older brother. And so uh I remember coming out of a bar in Golden, Colorado one night and just think, I am lost. Mm. I am, I am messed up. And uh, just started taking a class 
uh, and at mines, everything was science or math, except one humanities class. And the professor said, I have one question for you that we're going to look at all semester. And that is, what is a quality life? And wow. he had us read the Bible, he had us read the Book of Mormon, the Bhagavad Gita, the uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, all these books. He said, what's, what's their answers? Carlos Constanata. And, and so we'd read them, we'd give them the answer from the book, and he'd shoot it down even from the Bible. And so I, uh, everybody, all the engineers in there hated him. I think I'm the only one that got an A in that class because I took it seriously. It started me on the journey to really reflect on my life. Mm. Read my Bible that summer, transferred schools, went to University of Colorado, Tom Brown had just started a campus ministry. I looked it up in the phone book, the church. I, I had one, another older brother that's a very good Christian. He turned to in, eventually became an elder in the Church of Christ, and he had gone there. He had already graduated, but he had met Tom, so he encouraged me to go there. So I set up an appointment with Tom, went to church Sunday morning, took my roommate Sunday night, set up an appointment Monday, and confessed all my sins that first appointment. And it took off from there, became a true disciple. Tom studied with me, and I was maybe one of his easiest conversions because God had been working on me for several years. Wow. So were you restored? Were you baptized? What, what happened there? I, I uh, was restored at that time. And, and uh, then later uh, I got rebaptized. And, uh, you know, I think my first baptism was sort of a John the Baptist baptism. God, God uh, prepared me. And then uh, when I understood true discipleship and, and uh, really made Jesus the Lord of my life, I became a Christian. So later. I remember you sharing because when I was a young Christian at Berkeley, Tom Brown was my minister, was my minister. He had come mm -hmm. from Denver and you had shared about all the fighting and all the brawling. And I remember going, this guy is really aggressive, you know, just a, a fighter. That was my image uh, of you. And it's, it's pretty amazing. I want to talk more about that, but let's talk a little bit about University of Colorado, because that must have been an amazing time. Now, that was a little bit before I became a Christian in 86. Now, obviously, I think this maybe late 70s, but can you talk a little bit about that time? Because so many influential people became Christians during that time that became my ministers and kind of went all over the place. Can you just talk about what was going on there at, at the University of Colorado? Yeah, it was it was a tremendous time to Tom had been trained in Gainesville and that basically in the uh, one another relationships. We didn't call it discipling back then. We just called it one another relationships from all the one another verses in the Bible. And uh, he implemented prayer partners. And that was our close relationship that we would confess our sins and pray with one another instead of the Bible with each other on an ongoing basis. And, uh, I think that uh, we were products, children of the 60s, and then we became teenagers and young adults in the 70s. And uh, there was just such chaos in society that we were looking for stability and what was true. And we didn't believe in drugs. We didn't believe in <laughs> communes. And uh, we, we wanted to uh, create a better world. I think a lot of us had the seed planted of John F. K. and Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King to make a difference in the world that you may not live long, and so you need to make a difference. So we wanted to change the world. So we became Christians, and uh, we wanted to evangelize the world. We wanted to plant a campus ministry in every campus in America. That was our goal. And so we had a campus minister training program every Friday. And uh, I started going the first week. I remember Tom uh, saw me in there and asked me to step outside before the class came, began. And he said, well, you know, this, you just started coming to the church. You're not really a member yet. This class really isn't for you. And uh, do you want, want to become a minister or something? What are you doing here? And I said, no, I'm never going to be a minister, but I want to know what a minister knows. I want to know the Bible. I want to grow spiritually. I need all the help I can get to change. So he let me stay. And so I was in there my whole uh, four years of college and, and I trained for the ministry and never intended to go in the ministry. That's a whole nother story. God called me later. 
What year was ministry. what year was that that she transferred 19, over? 1977. So 77 to 81 is when I was in Boulder. And, uh, you know, uh, I just, it had been going about a semester. And so there were a couple Bible talks on campus. And then it just, the year I got there, it just sort of mushroomed. Uh, several guys, Tom Snyder, Tom Marks, uh, Henny Droger, Doug Beatty, uh, got converted. There was already a guy. Uh, one of the elder son, Dave Michael, who's a great brother in Boston, was leading the Bible talk, and another brother, and then Tom was leading the Bible talk, and, and they, we just started converting so many people. One semester, we had 50 uh, students baptized. We had Bible studies. We called them soul talks with, you know, 20 to one Bible talk in Baker Hall had 50 people coming to it at one time. Tom was leading, and uh, so it was it was uh, a, a spiritual revolution, mm. you know. You, you, had, you, had 50, poured out. you had 50 baptisms in a semester. Right. <laughs> so our, our campus ministry grew to a couple hundred. And while I was there, a singles ministry grew to a couple hundred. And the church grew to about 700 in just a matter of four or five years. It was fantastic. Wow. And we were committed. Jesus was the Lord of our lives, and we repented of sin. We mm -hmm. we we had uh, honest confession of sin and repentance, and uh, most of us had come from a very worldly background, and so we were like me, breaking free of drunkenness, drink, breaking free of immorality. I had been in a fraternity at Mines, and I didn't re up in Boulder and just. Uh, just to really committed my life to Jesus. Why did you leave the Colorado School of Mines? That's a great school. I mean, why? What what triggered that transfer? Well, we lost every football game, and I <laughs> I had only lost one game a year my junior and senior year of high school. We had a very great team, and so I didn't like losing. I was a perfectionist, and uh, my first semester, uh, like I said, I'd been valedictorian, so. I got the first two C's in my life. I flunked my first chemistry and calculus test because the other students had taken that in high school. I hadn't. I sort of went to a smaller school in Western Colorado. And so I thought I was too dumb for college. So I signed up for the Marines and almost went to the Marines and my dad wouldn't let me. And he made me go back to college. And uh, the next semester I got straight A's, but I'd already decided that Christmas break. I'm, I'm leaving here. I, I can't do this. I'm not smart enough. So I decided to go to Boulder. My brother that had been there said, uh, you know, you go to Boulder and at least don't give up on college yet. Wow. So I went there That's and that was God's will though. I, I can see how his hand was in that. And I had transferred to play baseball. I had been recruited to play baseball at Boulder. And when I got there, they dropped the program because of title nine, they had to drop several of the men's sports to uh, add women's sports. But that was God's hand too, to keep me out of focus on uh, athletics. And so I focused my time on, on the Lord wow. and the ministry. Now, how did you meet Kathy? Uh, that's a great story. Kathy uh, grew up in Texas in a small town, Plainview outside of Lubbock and her dad and grandparents and uncles were cotton farmers. But unfortunately her, uh, dad's parents and uh, her dad's parents got killed in a car wreck uh, when he was 16. And so he took over the family farm and he went ahead and dropped out of school and got married to Kathy's mom. And uh, they had four kids by the time they were 20. Wow. And so I think just the pressure of young married and, and all that uh, eventually hit him about 30 and, uh, her parents got a divorce, unfortunately, and uh, her mother had a brother in my hometown at Grand Junction, Colorado, the only relative outside of this small town in Texas. So she moved there with uh, the kids. And so I met Kathy in seventh grade uh, foreign language class. And uh, we were friends, but uh, eventually she got elected head girl at student council. I got elected head boy. She was a cheerleader. I was a athlete we we dated off and on we went steady part of several years but never a whole year we'd always break up 
And uh, then at the end of high school, I think we just decided it was best for us to go our separate ways. So she went to Texas Tech. I went to Mines and then Colorado. But when I became a Christian, I started reaching out to her. And uh, her uh, stepmother, uh, her dad married a stewardess for American Airlines so she could fly free. So I talked her into flying to Boulder and staying with the sisters. And they started studying the Bible with her. And uh, eventually she became Christian and transferred to Boulder. And so we went our last two years of college together and got married after college. That's awesome. Been so- married 40 years. That's fantastic. Now you, was Kathy raised in the church of Christ? No, she was raised, uh, in the Baptist church. Uh, she had grandparents that were Baptist and grandparents that were church of Christ. And there was that, uh, feud sort of over her baptism and instrumental music for in her family. And, uh, so no, she didn't go to church with me, uh, when we were young and it just, uh, she, basically said later that uh, she saw such a change. It, it made her curious and that's what caused her to come check it out. And then she saw the spirit of God in the, the church and the sisters and was attracted to it. Yeah. And uh, so. So you graduate now, Greg, how old are you? I'm 63. 63. We, yeah. In fact, since we met in junior high at 13, we've known each other 50 years married 40 years. Wow. So 63, you're born in what, 57? 58. 58. Okay. Beginning of 58. So you graduated college in 81? 81? Uh, uh, One degree of engineering I finished in 80 and I graduated with both degrees in 81. Okay. From that time, just, just Give me a, a recap of where you've been in the ministry since that time. Just give me a, a little fast forward here of all the different places. I know there's so many places and I shared, you know, read them at the beginning. Where have you been? Sure. Well, in Boulder there, I graduated and I uh, lived there, but we, we commuted. I commuted to Denver as a structural engineer. I worked for a company called Stanley Structures. It was a division of Stanley Tools and, uh, and eventually, the elders offered me the job as a campus ministry minister. Tom was uh, becoming sort of the associate minister, the young married minister. And I thought about it. I had to finish up some projects, so I put it off about uh, six months. And I decided to go in the ministry, and then I, uh, I'm just doing that out of guilt. I really shouldn't be a minister. I'm not a good enough person. <laughs> I'm not naturally spiritual. And... Uh, So I went back and forth and then I decided uh, I'll just do it for four years. I got blessed for four great years. So I'm going to do it for four years. And then I eventually wanted to go to law school. So I thought after those four years, I'll go to law school. I'd taken the test and the LSAT and was going to go to law school. So I decided I'll postpone it for four years and be a campus minister. But uh, during those four years, I just saw God do so many miracles that uh, I, uh, I fell in love with the ministry. I started going to Abilene uh, Christian uh, in summers to get a master's degree. And uh, then uh, after the four years were up, the San Diego church offered me a job as a co-evangelist with Gordon Ferguson. And uh, I just, at that time, decided I was going to stay in ministry, not go to, to go to law school. Okay. So you were there in San Diego that's what late late 80s yeah uh that's the mid 80s uh 85 86 87 and uh that was a tremendous time we did to what's called a life campaign love is for everyone the acronym life and uh lived in the dorms for several weeks and evangelized every day and uh again the church just multiplied it it blew up from about 150 to six seven hundred and uh i just saw so many lives uh, changed and and then from san diego we i moved to boston i just led the campus ministry at mit we we uh, wanted to unite in boston and go out from boston to evangelize the world before in the crossroads movement we really wanted to evangelize america and we want to evangelize campuses but then we got that bigger vision and moved to boston and uh i thought maybe i'd go to 
Poland because I have a Polish surname Moretzky and but uh, I got sent back to Denver and uh, that was great uh, had a tremendous time at Denver uh, the campus ministry really took off the church just mul mushroomed multiplied and uh, then the LA got started and they wanted uh, ministers that could lead a thousand people and uh, so uh, I got uh, recruited to LA and led the beach cities from the airport down to Long Beach and we started the campus ministry at Long Beach State and that did fantastic and uh, then uh, I got uh, sent back to Denver because of the evangelization proclamation we wanted to uh, plant a church in all 50 states and so I went to Denver and planted uh, nine churches in eight states to uh, sort of help fulfill the 50 state goal and uh, we moved about, uh, oh, uh, over 200 people uh, out of the Denver church to these eight places, at least 50 people per church. And uh, uh, this was incredible. Uh, Missoula, Boise, uh, Fargo, Sioux Falls, all these different, uh, Cheyenne, Carl Springs, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, all these churches got planted and uh, Nobody ever regretted a movie. They just, uh, they, they grew spiritually so much going on mission teams. And uh, no one ever regretted me asking them to move. And my faith was built up so much. God took care of people, gave them jobs, gave them new lives, gave them uh, purpose. And uh, that was a tremendous time. Saw great miracles. And then uh, got uh, recruited back to LA after those churches were planted to lead the West region. It uh, had gone through transition and needed some rejuvenation. So I went back to LA. What, and, when, what year did you go back? Uh, was, I think it was like 95. Uh, okay. And we were there for, for uh, five years uh, uh, and uh, planted the Malibu sector and uh, just some incredible times, incredible times. And then uh, uh, got sent to Dallas, Dallas, the great South family had gone through some transition. I, I sort of became sort of this uh, waterer, like an Apollos that other people maybe planted the church initially, but I came in and sort of helped revive things and restore things that sort of became my, my role. And so went to Dallas and, uh, uh, there the letter came out and there was a lot of uh, residual history with the leadership that that had preceded us and so it wasn't a very uh, healthy place or healthy time and uh, we ended up getting out of the ministry i went back to denver as a and worked in engineering and finished my doctorate in ministry and then decided to go to omaha a church we planted out of denver and uh, just go to a small church. So we were there for eight years. It's the hardest job I ever had. I was the only one on staff, but it was so rewarding. Mm. Tremendous time, a whole generation that had been lost, got restored, got brought back, got to, uh, committed. And now that church has a whole nother generation. We'll have a whole nother lifetime because mm. of uh, the people that uh, came back and uh, really become the foundation of the church as many of us have gotten older. And uh, then uh, here in the Antelope Valley outside of LA, they recruited us for about a year and we eventually felt like it was God's calling to come here. And it's been tremendous. It's been great to be back in LA, LA in the Pacific Southwest. And, and uh, so uh, this is where we'll retire, I imagine, unless God has another plan. Okay. So you moved, what, when did you move to Lancaster? We moved here six years ago. Okay. And, uh, so we're in our seventh year and uh, uh, the church had, had had a great minister, Bob and Barbara Hartpool uh, for first 13 years. And, and then uh, they had a very hard time, uh, had some real disruptive things happen. And, and uh, so they didn't have a minister for about a year, year and a half before we got here. And so it was hurting and uh, uh, things, went really well. We uh, hired a young staff, uh, um, Amir and Jewel Burton. Uh, we hired them and they got married and trained up in the ministry. 
now they're in another part of LA and Alden Angela Toriano moved from Denver and uh, led our Spanish speaking ministry, did a tremendous job. And then the pandemic hit and we had to downsize. And so now we have uh, just four young interns that we're raising up and uh, Manny and Angelina Perez, great young couple that will be part of the next generation of leaders and uh, Brian and Je uh, Kelly and Jessica Cave. So, you know, uh, at this point in time, I just continue to try to raise up uh, leaders for the kingdom. It's pretty amazing. I mean, there's so much to unpack there. Let me just go back a little bit to the 90s when you're planning all those churches. Who were some of the people that were sent out to lead during that time? Uh, Kurt Patty Simmons led our first church planting in Lincoln and did great. They uh, converted to Vince and Robin Hawkins, and then the Hawkins moved to Denver, and we trained for the ministry. Vince and I are still very close. Uh, Jay and Carol Kelly went out and uh, uh, did some tremendous things. Uh, uh, the Greens went to Missoula. Tom and Annie Snyder went to Salt Lake City. Mark and Annie McCune went to uh, Boise. Idaho, Mark and Julie Shelley, Shelley, who are elders in Denver, and he had uh, was a brother I was close to at MIT, uh, is an elder in Denver. He went to Cheyenne. Uh, Tim and Jerry Burnett went to Colorado Springs. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, some tremendous, tremendous people <laughs> stepping out in faith. It's so funny, Greg. When I talk to people, so many people mention your name. It You are one of the, the most broadly and deeply connected person persons that I know in the kingdom of God. Can you share with some of the, share with me some of the people that you've studied the Bible with that we might know? Oh yeah. yeah. You know, a lot of these folks, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I was, I was involved with the Marshall and Sean Mead with uh, Brian and Dessa uh, Craig with uh, Hans and Ann Rasmussen uh, uh, God blessed us with so many great neighbors. Uh, you won't know these names, but these are great Christians who have been faithful for decades. Uh, Luke and Tammy Owen are in Atlanta. They were converted in our neighborhood in Denver. Uh, Chad and Sandy Taggart in San Diego. Bob and Charlene Lisi are in the Columbia Church in South Carolina. They were converted in San Diego. Uh, you know, some neighbors here, uh, Erica and uh, Manny Perez, they're kids are in the ministry now here in our, our church. Uh, you know, uh, Doug and Angela wins, you know, lead the Houston church. Uh, just, uh, That's amazing. so, so many couples, I'm sorry. I don't have all the names right off the top of my head. Marshall, Marshall and Sean moved with us and Brian and Dessa moved with us to, uh, to Denver. Uh, there's a whole set of elders that, uh, uh were sort of not in the, in the, my age in the ministry in Boulder go, that went in the ministry, but this next age group, they all sort of became uh, elders and stayed by with Andy, Karina Wingy, and we we're in LA, uh, uh, John and Beth Chisholm in Denver, Todd and Cheryl Fink in Chicago, uh, uh, Mary and Lou Craig worked with us and they're in New York. Uh, uh, just, uh, uh, just, Great, great couples. That's pretty. that. Uh, oh, Charlie and Linda Eaton are in uh, Escondido, California. Uh, just a lot of great, great people. Greg, when you when you look back on that, I'm reminded of, of Paul's comment to the Thessalonians when he says, "You know, what is what is my joy? What is my crown? Is it is it not you?" And how how does it feel when you look back and and you've, you've got that kind of an impact? Well, I'm getting a little emotional because, uh, you know, I'm pretty humbled that God let me be in those situations to see him work. You know, I don't take credit for any of that, to God be the glory for it all. I mean, um, like I said, I really, <laughs> I think I got chosen like Paul to go in the ministry because uh, uh, sort of the worst of sinners, good visual aid, if he can change, anybody can change. And if if he can uh, go from a violent, angry man to a calm and gentle spirit, then then uh, other people can change. The best compliment anyone ever gave me was my wife said that uh, 
I had changed more than anybody she ever knew. Wow. And that's the greatest compliment of all the things that I've uh, been able to witness God do. That's, that's the biggest blessing in my life. And uh, he's blessed me with two great daughters, four great grandkids and a great wife, a wife that stuck with me through all the ways I needed to change. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about that. The change you no, I knew you when I was, like I sh- shared, when I was at, at UC Berkeley, Tom was the evangelist. It was all the Toms from, from Denver. They'd moved over, and Tom Marks, Tom Snyder, Tom Brown, Henning Droger was there. <clears throat> and Doug Beatty was leading my campus ministry, and, and I remember you would come, come up and preach, and San Diego was taking off, and San Francisco was growing as well. We had like a sister church relationship. But when you would preach, Greg, I mean, you had... You were like the prototype, in my mind, of the ICOC evangelist. Now, I, I mean, I think aggressive, bold, challenging, powerful, uh, you know, masculine. Just, I, I remember thinking, wow, this guy is a, he's a powerful man of God. And and there was, a, in my mind, there was a certain type. You know, Kip certainly had it, Marty, of, of aggressiveness, say what's on your mind, preach the word, challenge, get in your face, and really bring it. And there's a, a power. And, and yet over time, there's, you're a different person now that, than I remember back then. You, you've got added dimensions that I've never seen before. What happened to you? <laughs> okay, what, where, what changed? Well, I think that uh, that was more my natural temperament to be bold and loud. I mean, growing up with four boys, a dad that was a truck driver, you know, but uh, I think that God gave me two daughters and a very temperate, gentle wife to round me out, to compliment me. I think I've become more like my, my wife in good ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, God, God used the strengths I had, but all along he wanted to add to my uh, emotional spectrum, my, my mental spectrum, my, uh, my, my, just my skills and ability. And, uh, so I, I think through God's discipleship, he's softened me. I, I think that, uh, I have a theology of God that I sort of simplified systematic theology is very complex, but my theology is of the, of God is that God is three things. He's He's righteous. He's holy. Number two, he's faithful. He fulfills his promises. He's good. And thirdly, that he's merciful and gracious. And those three concepts come from the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. The death of Jesus is God is righteous or holy. The burial, God is faithful. And the resurrection, God is gracious. And I think I leaned way too much on God's righteousness, his holiness, I was a perfectionist for way too long. You know, I, I wrestled until I started losing and I quit because mm. I, I didn't deal with loss very well. Mm. And uh, I was, so I tended to be harsher and I tended to be legalistic. And I was more on the holiness of God and the faithfulness, the commitment, die to self, you know, be a soldier. And I really, I believed in grace, but I didn't live it out. I didn't give myself grace and I didn't give other people enough grace. And so these three things I, I believe have to be intention. Mm. It's more than a dialectic of grace and righteousness. I, I add God's faithfulness. So it's a trialectic. It's something I sort of made up mm. that all three things like a three-legged stool or intention at the same time. And so I think my personality had to become more merciful and softer and gracious and and uh, uh, God broke me when I got out of the ministry in Dallas. I had worked hard and tried to be perfect and just saw that, you know, I'm never going to be perfect. And uh, I felt like I'd, I'd failed God and I had failed in the ministry by not being uh, more gentle and patient and being too hard. And uh, uh, people gave me feedback about... Uh, the hurt that I had, I'd caused and that broke me. And, uh, so I, I, I studied out grace. God gave me grace. Uh, 
And uh, I studied counseling and I got more self-aware and I saw that uh, a lot of my legalism and my drive had come from shame that I still felt like deep down I was defective in ways that my anger, I better stay a good Christian or it's going to come back. My sinful nature is so strong and I'm, I have this evil, one of the ministers, I won't tell you their name, <laughs> an older brother had told me when I was a young minister that I had a cold part of my heart, that I was a scary person. Mm. And that always haunted me. Mm. And I went to a counselor way back then. And he said, nah, you're normal. Don't that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you believe those things. And right. so, uh, but when I got the counseling degree, I had to do count. They counseled you for a year. And I saw that I, I, uh, hadn't given myself grace that I had shame from things I'd repented of 30 years before and had not committed this since for 30 years. And so I, I hope now what the change you may maybe are referring to is that I've just gotten whole, more whole, more complete at those things that I did before there, there's a lot of good and a lot of imitation of uh, righteous uh, God's conviction and God's holiness, but uh, uh, it always has to be balanced with God's grace. So. One question I have, and I think about from time to time, is you you were a driver, and there are a number of people that were drivers. I mean, power, I think about Bruce Williams. He disciples me. And, I mean, he, Bruce is a classic type A driver, powerful, a little scary, intimidating for sure. I remember just kind of being afraid of him. Um, you know, Ed, Ed, uh, Townsend discipled me for a period of time. He was a little intimidating at times, but there was a, an aggressiveness, a, an aggressive spirit that I think drove the ministry during that time. And, and just like you shared, there were so many miracles happening. Do you feel like we've lost something along the line? I mean, I think for sure the tone of our ministry has swung way, way over toward, you know, more loving, more sensitive, more caring. Uh, I, I don't think you're the only person that's that's undergone a transformation. But do you feel like that slowed down the ministry to a certain degree? I, 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 I wonder at times, I go, boy, I wonder if we need more Steve Jobs types, more, you know, Jeff Bezos types in terms of just drivers to see things, amazing things happen again. What's your what's your thought on that? Oh, I, I think, yeah. I have to have a driver. I, I, I praise my father for his work ethic, my mother for her work ethic. They grew up out of the depression and I grew up uh, uh, poor to lower middle class. And uh, so there's a thirst there. That's that's a hard work ethic. I, I, I would say that uh, I think that uh, uh, people that have lived through wars, lived through economic depression, lived through hardship are tough. Yeah. They're strong, uh, steeled people. And we need steeled people. I, I believe that we witnessed so many miracles because we we did things with faith. We, we gave up everything and right. walked away from careers and uh, material things and, and, and wealth. And uh, I think the sacrifice needs to get back to the level where it was at. I think the commitment uh, and the hard work ethic. And right. I, I think there's a lot of let's be comfortable Christians. Right. And and uh, the world's too short. You know, I, I don't regret my life. I don't regret the sacrifices. I don't regret the the moves. Uh, it's all been to God's glory. That's and right. I, I was genuine and sincere, and God used it. And uh, uh, I, I pray that we will rekindle our fire. I think it was a little easier. We were, we were uh, Christianity wasn't on the outskirts of society as it is now. I think the job, the challenge may be harder in America. I mean, Christianity is growing in multiplying ways in the global South, just not in Western civilization in the, in the North. And uh, uh yeah, I think that's partly why we're getting humbled in ways. Right. Whether so, but yeah, we need both. Okay. So Greg, I got to ask you why so many degrees? I mean, I, I, I knew you had a <laughs> bunch question. of degrees, but I, I read through this. I go, that's, 
that's almost 10 degrees. I mean, I, I don't know exactly how many that is, but that is a lot. What What's driving all of that education? Uh, I think I needed to continue to feed my faith. I, I had started the degree at Abilene Christian, uh, the MS in, in ministry uh, back in the 80s. And then our movement, we were very busy planting churches and going all around the world. And uh, we did not emphasize uh, academics and our, our movement, even out of the restoration heritage was our side of it in the church crisis and then the international church crisis, sort of anti-intellectual. Mm -hmm. And the church of Christ shifted and we didn't shift. We stayed anti-intellectual. And uh, when I was hitting my forties, I'd say maybe midlife crisis. I'm like, I need to finish things I've started. So I need to finish this degree. And I was in LA near Pepperdine. And so uh, I happened to apply and the chairman of the department of Abilene when I'd started in 1985 was the chairman of the department at Pepperdine in, in 1989, you know, uh, I mean, 1998. And uh, so I had a 10 year sabbatical there and I went back and then I haven't stopped, frankly, for the last 20 years going to school because uh, I've needed to feed my soul and I have decided I'm not going to rely on others interpretation of things I need to, I'm on a level I want to be professional to the point where I uh, know the language, the original languages, and I know theology and I know uh, human behavior, human development to a point where I'm come, I'm resolving my own questions and, and that kind of thing, just filling the gaps. And, and, uh, I, I think I, I love learning. I, uh, uh, I think that because of the dysfunction in my family, we, I grew up right across the street from the elementary school and I stayed late and cleaned out the classroom and swept it. And my mother was at work. And so I didn't want to go home till she, for a couple hours till she got home. And so I just became a good student in elementary school and have loved studies. And uh, so uh, this PhD in leadership, I decided I'd, I'd start it, see where it led me. And I've read over a hundred books in the last couple of years and I've loved every one of them. And mm. so why stop if you love it and it's feeding you? And I needed to answer some questions too about uh, some of the, uh, how to rekindle our movement, how, what was strong about it, what was weak about it, what can we learn from it and pass it on to the next generation. And I love the counseling. My wife got me into that because it made me more of a listener. I, I, I spoke too much for too many years. Now I have learned to listen. So I don't think every minister has to do what I do, but I wanted to bunk something. Uh, in our, our movement, we used Acts uh, 4.13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished that, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Uh, this is when the apostles were getting uh, questioned by the Jewish leaders. And so we've used that to say, we don't need to get uh, theological education. We don't need higher education, right? But it really teaches the opposite that uh, ed higher education at that time was attach yourself to a rabbi for several years and be an apprentice and get trained up. And so all the apostles, all 12 of them had a higher degree in theology and religion and spirituality because they were with Jesus for three years. They right. recognized these guys are highly educated. They started out ordinary, common fishermen, uneducated, not chosen by any rabbi mm -hmm. to get higher education. And then Jesus chose them. And these are truly spiritual, godly, informed people. Mm -hmm. And so what has been used to say you don't need the degree is exactly the passage that says you do need it. Mm -hmm. if, if, we, if these guys need it trained for three years by Jesus, the greatest teacher, the greatest rabbi, then how much education do we need? Right. And then Ecclesiastes, uh, I gave a commencement speed at Rocky Mountain one year and used Ecclesiastes 1, but the, this passage in Ecclesiastes 12, 9 through 13 says, 
Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded na nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them, of making many books. There's no end, and much study wearies the body. But now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. So I think uh, the scriptures exalt education mm. and knowledge, just to use it the right way. It will humble you. It will teach you that there's, there's more that you don't know than you know. Right. But... Uh, I think we need to be professional. I think uh, uh, if you're if you're capable, you should use your multiply your gifts and talents. So, how do you do ministry and go to school at the same time? You you seem to make it look easy, but how, how do you do that? Uh, you know, I think that uh, getting an engineering degree and a business degree in five years, uh, I had to take eighteen credits a semester and go to summer school three years, and so. And by going to Colorado School of Mines, it's sort of like an MIT of, of petroleum engineering, right. mining and engineering. And so uh, the kids there study eight hours a day, seven days a week at MIT. They're brilliant, but they have to work hard. And so I think uh, even through sports, and uh, I, I was trained to use my time in a block method. And so I, all through school, went to school from eight to 12, got up, had eight o'clock classes until 12, had a snack for lunch, went to the library till five. And then I did the ministry in the evening and then got back to school like at nine or 10 until 12. And uh, uh, so I just, all my uh, student uh, life, I've, I've realized that you, you don't know what you don't know and you're not gonna learn it immediately. You've got to put in the work. And uh, so then when I went back to graduate school, uh, when I was approaching 40 and I had two preteen daughters and I uh, was leading a region in Los Angeles and uh, overseeing a whole geographic area outside of Los Angeles, I was very busy and uh, had a lot of my schedule dictated to me by uh, what was I was responsible for. I ended up learning how to study from 10 o'clock till two in the morning. And so I'm one of these people that could uh, uh, get by on five hours of sleep a night. And uh, so many, many years, that's how I lived. And then your body starts giving away. And uh, I get eight hours now. I, uh, I won't live to a hundred, but if I can live till 85, praise, <laughs> praise the Lord. But uh uh, I, I think that ministry, you have a flexible schedule, and I, I think that uh, going to school and doing ministry forces you to be more disciplined with your time mm. and to do good time management. There's plenty of time there, but uh, it does take time management. And even now in this PhD, you know, I block out either a, a whole Friday, a whole Saturday, or a whole Sunday afternoon or a Monday to read. I have to read at least about 12 hours, one of those days. So I have the flexibility to move it around for ministry, but I have to do those kind of blocks. And then uh, I, I do my sermons and everything on Mondays. We film on, on uh, Tuesdays. And then uh, uh, I do my midweek and I film it and everything. So I sort of front load a lot of ministry stuff, Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, uh, do a lot of school, and then uh, again, flexible on the weekend. That's when you do a lot of ministry in the evenings and weekends, but you just have to get a rhythm and you get disciplined. And I enjoy it. I, 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 do, I have a lot of energy and have thankfully for 63 years. And so, uh, uh, but uh, I walk every morning and pray and that keeps my metabolism healthy. And I eat uh, mainly an all plant diet now i didn't always but you have to adjust as you get older but uh, i i believe that it helps ministers in their professionalism i think that the uh, sermons my sermons are deeper and richer and uh, 
when you're when you're bringing so much in, you have a lot more to share. Right. And my theology of preaching is uh, listen before you speak. Mm. So you have to do the research. You have to listen to God. You have to be prayerful in your Bible before you speak. Otherwise, you shouldn't speak, and you don't have anything to say other than your own opinion. And we're messengers, we're heralds, we're ambassadors. We don't make our own message. We we give God's message. We're God, gossipers of God's message, mm -hmm. gospelizers mm -hmm. of the God news, good news, not our own. So. Wow. You shared that when you're at the Colorado School of Mines, you felt like you weren't smart enough to stay in the program. And here you are you going off and getting all these multiple degrees and PhDs. What advice would you give to a person who's hesitant about theology school, whether because of time restraints or feeling like, am I really smart enough to be able to do that? Any word of encouragement? Oh, yeah, just persevere. I mean, I I, I thought two months ago I wasn't smart enough to finish this PhD. <laughs> I, I had a professor that uh, was not pleased with my writing and he said that you're at a point now the learning curve is vertical at uh, you don't write the way you did at undergrad or even former graduate now it's academic writing you have to become a scholar and you have to change completely the way you write and i thought i, I can't change i've been doing this for 40 years but i changed and so you have to be flexible you have to be humble you have to be teachable i mean i i feel like i've been I was broken a few months ago uh, to be willing to change and, and write better. Mm. And uh, years ago, I had a stigma planted in my mind that, that uh, you know, you have great thoughts, Greg, but it's just incoherent. You're writing mm. at my first gr graduate class. And uh, when I went back when I was 40 and I later brought that comment up to the pro a professor about 10 years later, he says, Oh, I don't remember ever saying that to you. You're a good writer. <laughs> And, that but that had stuck with me. So I think just anyone can do it if they'll persevere and they'll be flexible and, and continually change. You have to be a lifelong learner. You have to be humble. And, uh, uh, you know, I thought by now, by now, especially being a teacher myself, that this PhD would be uh, easier but it's not. Every level is really hard. Mm. And you just have to let it shape you. Uh, the motto of our program at Johnson is uh, to uh, uh, not just uh, get a PhD degree, but become a PhD. Mm. And what they mean by that is let it transform you, mm. become a scholar, become a, a, a better student. So. Do you have plans to write your own commentary series? Yeah, I have uh, outlines of every chapter of the New Testament already. I've gone through and taught each book, and uh, I just need to write that stuff up. I'm going to hopefully, Lord willing, retire from full-time preaching in uh, three years or so, maybe four, and uh, then just start writing and teaching. And I have a lot of books in me, and just depends on God's will to get them out. But uh, um, I don't, I, I, I have sort of regretted I didn't take time aside and just write some books. But now I feel like, well, they're going to be better and I'll be proud of them. Won't wish I rewrote them after a year or two now. So there you go. Uh, that's, that's my plan. What, what programs do you recommend? I, I know that there are a lot of great programs out there and there are people listening from around the world. Any recommendations for a master's program, like a, a first master's program? We don't need to talk about PhD programs, but let's just talk about if a person has an undergraduate degree, they'd like to pursue more education. Give us, give us some roadmaps of where to go. Sure. Well, I found from my background in the restoration movement and the Churches of Christ and the ICOC that uh, I wasn't as comfortable in a school that, that didn't hold to some of the same fundamental tenets that I hold to as far as the inspiration of scripture uh, about the, the uh, primacy of conversion and, and uh, discipleship and, and repentance and baptism and uh, 
that kind of thing. And so uh, I found that uh, Restoration Churches, schools like uh, Abilene and Pepperdine and uh, uh, Rochester and Lipscomb and Harding have been fantastic uh, places for me to learn and for other scholars that I've met from those places to converse with. I've really enjoyed the Christian church uh, uh, connection that I've made at Johnson University. It used to be Johnson Bible College in Knoxville, Tennessee. It's the oldest Christian out of uh, the Restoration Movement school in America. And it's been a tremendous uh, blessing to my life. Every, every class has a, an element of spiritual formation. Every week you have to write a reflection on uh, what you're learning, how it applies to ministry and applies to your spirituality. And so I, I, I went to uh, SMU and went to uh, uh, the, the Perkins School of Theology there uh, for a period of time, got a, uh, did Hebrew at SMU. And, and it's a tremendous school, but because it's not out of our same heritage, I, I didn't connect as much to the other students. I didn't uh, connect as much to the professors. And uh, they were training Methodist ministers. They weren't training at Church of Christ or Christian ministers. And uh, so that's when I, I, I felt like staying in the Restoration Heritage was the best thing for me. And I love Pepperdine. I, they have great scholars there. But, and I love Dabbling. They have great Christian scholars there and, mm. and some great spiritual men. And uh, uh, one of my professors from... Uh, Abilene is the dean at uh, Rochester, and we've got this master's in, relig in uh, missional leadership that we promote, and it's great. And then our school at Rocky Mountain School of Theology in Denver uh, is a tremendous place, maybe the first place students ought to go uh, to get uh, just grounded uh, in biblical education. Steve Kennard's a, a genius, brilliant scholar. Douglas Jack, Glenn Giles is one of the greatest scholars of all my professors that I've ever had. I, I respect Glenn as much as anybody as far as his uh, acumen. When I was finishing my doctorate of ministry, I was working, running an engineering company and going to Denver Seminary at night. And who do I run into? Glenn Giles. He's there almost every night. And he wasn't even working on a degree at that time. And so uh, uh, our, our, our school that we're building up at, in Denver is tremendous as well. And the, the Rochester one is a, an accredited, uh, inexpensive leadership, practical ministry degree. If you want to go on to be a scholar, uh, Abilene and Pepperdine and Harding will give you the languages and, a, a, a different kind of degree than the missional leadership degree. But if you just want to do ministry better, Rochester is a great place. That's and then Lipscomb is a great place for a doctorate of ministry and missional leadership. So each school has its strengths. So what, what about a school like Fuller Seminary or something that when I, when I hear about, you know, theology schools, Fuller definitely is some, someone I've heard. So would you, would you say, don't, don't go to that because it's not part of our family of churches? No, Fuller is a, is one of the most respected uh, conservative seminaries in the world. And it's an evangelical, it's probably one of the most respected along with Wheaton, but it, it offers more uh, higher education, PhD degrees. And so I think if someone wants to become a professor or, or a real scholar, uh, I think going to a, a Fuller, going to, you know, a Duke, there's, there's some tremendous uh, schools of theology. And it's amazing how uh, scholars out of the Stone Campbell movement are professors at a lot of these schools at, at, at Hard, Harvard and Yale and uh, Princeton and uh, Emory. There, there's Church of Christ scholars out of the, the Stone Campbell heritage that are, are professors at these different places, Notre Dame. And so you, when you get to the highest level of academia, uh, you can sort of eat the meat and throw away the bones. And uh, I think it's at that point, depending on what your 
uh, professional goals are is where you should go to school okay. and where you can get in. <laughs> right. So let's talk a little bit about that. What if what if you are leading a ministry or Bible talk or church somewhere where you're not in a large city, you're not in a, a big place where there's a, a campus nearby. What do you do? How can you how can you go to school and not not be near a theology campus? Well, that's the great thing uh, about uh, uh, some of these schools. Uh, Pepperdine hasn't shifted to an online place uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, Abilene has a few. Rochester is almost exclusively online, has a, a beginning of the semester residency, which mix is a good mix. Uh, uh, the program I'm in is all online, the PhD program. And so I think uh, uh, there are a lot of more opportunities probably in the last five years to do it all online. I would recommend if you could do a mixture, that's better because then you connect more in relationship with the professors and with the other students. Uh, we have a retreat in the program I'm in, in July each summer. And that has made all the difference. And you go to school for a year with people that you get close to, but you've never met. But then once you meet them, there's that connection and then that carries into the future. So I like the combo hybrid situation the best. Okay, so even if you're living overseas, you could take part in some of these programs. And almost everything that Rocky Mountain does is online. Okay. And, and that's one of the beauties of that. And that's why so many of the overseas brothers and, and sisters are going to Rocky Mountain because it is so accessible. And it's uh, in ex less expensive for uh, overseas ministers. Okay, so the Rocky Mountain um, Theology School, that's... Is that led by, is that an ICOC? Yes, it's school? all ICOC professors and Glenn Giles uh, leads it. It's under the oversight of the Dimmer uh, eldership, Dimmer leadership. And we're working towards accreditation there. And uh, hopefully within the next several years, we'll have accreditation. That's just a long process. One of the things you mentioned in your studies is tackling the issue of how we can revive our churches, how we can see the kind of growth that you talked about, the 50 baptisms in a semester or the expansion, getting the church. It's something I think about all the time. We we recently planted this church in Flagstaff, Arizona, and it was awesome. I mean, just it, it brought back memories, like what you're sharing about in the early 90s when you plant, send out eight plantings. You know, that's, this is a, it, it's a shade, it's a shadow of what, was once a super strong aspect of our movement. But Greg, what, what's, what's your thoughts? How do we get the movement moving? Well, uh, it's always easier to start from scratch than to do a remodel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have a, a piece of ground and you just start building, you can design it how you want. It can, you can build it however. But if, if you go and you buy something, you want to remodel it, it's a lot more complicated. And what I feel like has happened in our movement is we began with a tremendous faith. We came out of campus ministry with great faith. We saw miracles, great, many people converted. We took that to a citywide model, saw great growth. We took it worldwide and saw great growth. And then I think culturally and even we aged and we started slowing down and we didn't even adjust our ministry style and our ministry approach to different age groups. We didn't have a good developmental growth model. We were trying to do the same thing with every group in every place. And I think we've learned a lot about the diversity of ministry and, and that kind of thing. But I, I think that uh, people's faith got shaken. I would say the dream got burst. And so it may take a ne the next generation to revive that dream. I have been trying to rebuild the faith of the brothers and sisters that uh, had their faith shaken. Uh, and, and, and that's being accomplished and people are, are gaining their faith back and, and uh, uh, more getting more and more excited, more and more 
But I'm hoping that this revival comes from the next generation. I hope that they, they haven't had uh, disappointment. They haven't had their faith shaken. And I hope they just commit fully to Jesus as Lord and are willing to do whatever God calls them to do and go all around the world with faith and trust in our almighty God and get to witness the miracle, miracles even greater than we got to witness. Mm -hmm. And I believe they can do that. And, and I think it's going to be calling the, the, the people like apostle Paul and uh, you know, people that want that are aggressive type a personalities that are are entrepreneurial these churches were planted by guys that solved problems on the fly and made things happen in days and weeks not months years right and uh, uh you have to be strong you have to be uh a visionary and uh, i hope we call those people into the ministry and they take up the calling and uh, that they uh, step out in faith and want to change the world for, for better. The world it, it needs changed. Yeah. I mean, it needs brought together. It's, it's fragmented. It's it, the hatred the the divisions are growing. And uh, I believe God's pouring out his spirit. I think there's going to be uh, a revival, a great awakening. And right. When we, we, we start thinking that uh, it's just, uh, drifting or dying or diminishing god revives it there'll, there'll be a great awakening and i believe it seems to come in cycles about every 40 years so we're about due that's right that's right i wonder what's around the corner yep when you look back on your career what are you the most proud of oh there's just so many things uh uh you know uh, almost every place I've been, there's, there's something I could point to the early Boulder ministry, the older, the, the next generation, when I was the, the, the campus minister, and then the leader of the church, the, the San Diego uh, explosion, the MIT, that was a, a, a challenging ministry, but we converted one genius a month and they're still faithful <laughs> and one kid has 25 patents and the other's a Harvard doctor and a MIT PhD. I mean, just incredible people. Uh, uh, the, the Denver plantings, the LA mega church, the Omaha revitalization here, uh, just raising up new leaders. Uh, I'm probably most proud of, uh, trying to uh of training people for the ministry and 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 uh, uh of uh and people staying faithful that were converted mm. and uh my marriage my children very thankful for that and uh i'm thankful that uh, god has allowed me to continue to grow. I, 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 I'm I used to be embarrassed of the degrees. Now I, now I'm not, I, somebody needs to, 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 uh, set an example of, of scholarship. And I'm trying to do that. And, uh, I've inspired people to be counselors and, and to get academic education in, in, in theological education. Um, uh, but, uh, I, I'm probably just, thankful I could be a part of this movement, yeah. you know, and uh, I've thought about, you know, when you get older and you have friends that die and mm -hmm. you know, you, your, your finitude is coming. All I can say is I'm proud of being a good man. Mm. God's helped me to be a good man. I'm not perfect. I'm not blameless. I'm still growing. I'm still changing. I love God with all my heart. I love people. God's transformed me. I didn't like people. I like, I, I hated a lot of people when I was a non-Christian, but, uh, I'm probably most proud that, uh, I, 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 I can say I'm good. Mm. I'm not perfect, but, uh, I, I'm not, I'm authentic. I, I'm honest. Yeah. I'm, I'm repentant. I'm transparent. <laughs> <laughs> so, and though I wasn't those things as an, I'm Christian. I wouldn't be those things if I weren't in the ministry too. I love the ministry. I, I, 
I, I, uh, I, I, there were times where I wondered whether I, I should have been in ministry all these years. Sometimes I thought this is the only way I'd get to heaven. I don't think those things are true. I just think this was the way God knew I'd be happiest. Mm. And, and I have had a happy life. I've got to travel the world and witness miracles all over the world, help plant a church in Kiev and watched all the stuff in Russia and Eurasia firsthand and got to see so many things. So, uh, that's a big question. I didn't yes. give a very succinct answer. That's but. great. No. What, what was most difficult or do, what do you wish you could do differently? Uh, I wish I would have continued my education and not taken that sabbatical because I think it, uh, it, it helped me to, uh, fill in the gaps that if they would have been fill, filled in earlier, maybe I could have done even more good and might not have done uh, some of uh, the damage. I think God heals people from that thing, but uh, I think uh, um, um, I, 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 I think having, like I said, that balance of, of holiness, righteousness, grace and faithfulness i think that uh, maybe that does take time a difficult complex transformation doesn't occur right away mm -hmm. but i think if i could have made those connections uh the other thing for me i'll just be honest uh, i was a part of trying to create unity between the churches of christ the international churches of christ with the abilene christian lectureship uh, summit summit talks and I, I'm still uh, devoted to the unity of all Christians. I think the kingdom of God needs to include all disciples and all Christians. And I don't know how to do that. I don't know. Uh, there's different cultures or different uh, uh, convict levels of conviction, degrees of that. And uh, I, I, but I, I'd love to, to have continued that, been more effective at it. But I don't, I don't see that uh, as as a very popular thing. Right. So right. I don't know where it's ever going to go. Right. What advice would you give to a person who wants to make this life count? Be the best uh, Christian you can be. I'm constantly preaching that. Be your best self, and keep growing. Be a lifelong learner. That's awesome. Uh, I think that if you don't continue to grow and learn, life changes so much. We're in the age of complexity. Uh, life is going to continue to change and change rapidly. And we're going to get thrown curves like this pandemic or uh, inflation or whatever. Who knows what's around the corner? And you just have to be adaptable and growing and, uh, and have a strong faith that God's got a plan and I got to, I just need to to be content with plenty, with lean, with little, and uh, it's all going to be okay. Greg, thanks for the program today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Rob. Tremendous being with you. Thank you so much for joining the Rob Skinner Podcast. If you're enjoying this podcast, please hit the subscribe button and let your friends know about it and how to find it. Because my goal is to inspire you to make this life count live a no regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day and make this life count.